This has come to the table. Bible studies from the New Testament Christian Church of Cheyenne. These studies are presented every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at our church at 3800 East Pershing Boulevard in Cheyenne, Wyoming. If you'd like to contribute to these studies, you can make a donation at www.myntcc.org backslash Cheyenne WY dash giving. Matthew chapter 13, we're continuing our study in the parables of Jesus, of which there are several in this chapter. And we're going to jump right into the next parable. Last week, we, we've talked enough about the parable of the sower and about the parable of the tares of the field. And so, verse 31, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, there's about two or three big lessons right in these two verses. It's a short parable, I know, two verses long. So let's, let's dig into it. Usually when we hear about the mustard seed, it's usually someone talking about faith. Though if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and that's perfectly legitimate. I think Jesus talked about that. But here in this parable, he's likening the kingdom of heaven to a grain or to a mustard seed. And if you've ever seen them, if you ever looked at pictures of them, they are incredibly small. They're not the smallest. There are seeds in the world that are smaller than that. There's a certain species of orchid, I think, in Southeast Asia has a seed that's only like 0.2 millimeters. It takes 3 million of them to weigh in at one gram. So the mustard seed is small, but it's not that small. But it's very likely that it was the smallest seed that a farmer ever bothered planting 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. It's, a, it's the smallest uh, seed that yields herbs or something along those lines. And so he says, it is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown. And that's the key to this parable right here, is that phrase right there. When it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree. Now, it's not the largest of trees, but it becomes a pretty sizable tree. The mustard tree is pretty big. It's bigger than that little adolescent pear tree that I watched those deer eating the pears off of years ago up in Washington. It's a good sized tree. And so what's the message of the parable? That's the key. What's the message of it? Well, everything starts out small, doesn't it? We certainly did. People, babies, they come out pretty tiny. We all start out small, some of us smaller than others. And then churches start out small when they're brand new. As we've said many times, three years ago this month when we came to town, it was an empty building. Our first, our first service uh, had my wife and I in it. Uh, our overseer, one of our, one of our overseers and his wife was there. And then there was a guy traveling through town literally that day and never again. He just happened to be in town that Sunday morning. And then there was one of the fellow. And that was it. That was our very first Sunday morning service. And then Sunday night, I think we had our very first visitor. So growth began instantly. It began immediately. And then through prayer, work, outreach, labor, faithfulness of those that were here, it's grown and it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. It's not really what it's all about anyway. It's not just about numbers. It's about numbers hearing the gospel and letting that gospel change their lives, letting the God of that gospel change their lives. But here, the message is clear, or the parable is clear. Everything starts out small, but if it's watered, if it's cared for, if it's nurtured, if it's fertilized, if it's exercised and cultivated, it grows. And now check this out, okay? Because this is what jumped out at me as I was preparing for this. It says, all right, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Okay, so that tells us that it starts out exceedingly small. But a man took it and he sowed it in his field. So he took that seed and he put it in an environment where it could grow. And what's church but an environment where every one of us believers are capable of growing if we're willing to grow. If we're willing to grow. And then he says, verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs 
and becometh a tree. Okay, well now what's a tree good for? And this relates to some extent what we talked about at two, uh, two, par- two parables prior to this, the parable of the sower uh, and how, it, how the good ground allows that seed to germinate and then to grow and then ultimately it bears fruit. And we talked, we've talked a lot lately about how fruit benefits everything and everyone. And in the spiritual sense, that fruit benefits everyone and everything in the spiritual sense. Even those that are outside the faith benefit from the spiritual growth of believers. So you beat that drum a lot lately, preacher. Can you move on to something else? No, because that's a critical theme. It's a very important theme in the growth of a believer because that's one of the things that when we take it to heart and it grows and it blooms in our understanding and it actually comes to fruition in our life, that's something that moves us out of adolescent Christianity and into adult Christianity. And that's a major transition in the life of a believer. That's when someone has... Now, we all need to be ministered unto, granted. But that's when a person reaches a point where they're like, you know what, how can I help this thing so that others can be ministered unto? And that's a big, big step in the life of a Christian. It's a critically important step in the life of a Christian because that's when we have ceased to be the most important person in the world to ourselves and someone else's. There was someone who made this statement. And he was talking about, um, he was talking about just regular maturity, you know, growing from childhood into, into adulthood. He says, you're not really grown up until someone else is more important than you are. And he was talking about it in terms of, or he, he was talking about it in the context of uh, beginning a family. Well, not everybody has the luxury of beginning a family. Not everybody has that privilege. It all depends on decisions that people make and how things play out. There's time and chance that plays into all of that. But his point was, when you bring a child into this world, it's no longer about you. It ain't about you anymore. And there are people that think that they are not selfish until they get married. And then they realize, whoa, I've been a pretty selfish person because now I have another person to think about in this life. And then when they have their first child, then they really learn how selfish they've been. And because that's, that's a next level deal. Because when you get married, okay, yeah, fine, sure, someone else is depending on you, but they're an adult. They're capable of making their own coffee if they have to, or they're capable of, you know, taking care. They took care of themselves before they met you. You know, if they have to, in a pinch, they can take care of themselves again. But you bring a child into this world, that little squawker can't do nothing for themselves. Nothing for themselves, except make noise and make a mess. Amen? Amen. Wah. Okay, and at the worst times. At the worst times. And I've heard that over and over again. Just when we're ready to head out the door, Junior has an epic movement. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on. But Jesus says here, but when it is grown... It's the greatest among herbs. It becometh a tree so that, and this, this is where he's getting to here, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. When we grow outside of our tiny little mustard seed dimensions and we, we grow up and spring up into, into the plant, if you will. It's all a metaphor. It's a parable. We grow up into a large tree that God would have us to be. That tree provides an awful lot. A lot of good comes from trees and not just by chopping the things down to make a new dining room table or new altars. We're planning on replacing these here within the medium term uh, future. We're plan on doing some other improvements that aren't just functional improvements. We also want to make some things that look nice here in the sanctuary. New altars, uh, a table up here for use, and perhaps some other things. All things in due time. But trees are wonderful for providing shade. And everybody uses shade. People park under uh, under trees to get shade when they don't want their cars to get hot. Animals park under shade when they don't want to get hot. People sit under shade. And then trees, of course, they provide fruit if they're a fruiting tree. And it also provides a lodging place. And that's the metaphor that he uses here. So he says, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So 
What's that to us? Let's grow. Same as the parable of the sower. The sower that went forth to sow seed. Some landed on the wayside ground, couldn't grow at all. Some landed on the stony ground, could only grow a little bit, and then a little bit of stress killed that seed. And some among thorny ground, which grew until all the cares of life and the thorns choked it out. But the seed that fell into the good good ground, that grew. The Word of God in our hearts grows and bears fruit in our lives, and it benefits, once again, it benefits everyone. Did you know that the unsaved spouse of a saved, of a, of a believer, benefits from the Christianity of their spouse? Really does. It might irritate the daylights out of that unsaved spouse at times, but they really do benefit from that. They benefit from it quite a bit. Now, it doesn't mean that we get sanctimonious with them. Because it's one of the worst things that a believing that, that a believer can do with their mate if their mate is unsaved is to browbeat them with the word of God and Bible thump them to death with the word of God. Because that just makes them mad, and understandably so. But when we live our lives in meekness, humility, and what the Bible lays upon us according to his word, well. Everybody benefits. And so I know we've beat that drum quite a bit in these last, uh, these last two or three weeks in Bible studies, but the lesson is there in Jesus. It may seem redundant, but it's redundant for a reason. Because people that didn't understand the parable of the sower understand this one. That mustard seed is tiny, but when it's grown, it's big. And when it's big, everybody benefits from it. And so, all right, well, what's this thing about the birds lodging in it? There, Okay, well, you have a mature Christian who has a, whose worldview, if you will, that's a term that gets used probably a bit over much. It's starting to get kind of threadbare. But you have a mature Christian whose outlook on life and whose worldview extends beyond the priorities of their own four walls of their house. Then they're in a place where they can offer encouragement to others instead of always seeking to gain encouragement from others. A a, a tree that's bearing fruit has all that it needs. It evidently does because it's bearing fruit. It has all the food and the moisture that it needs. That harkens back to Psalm 1. What David was talking about in that psalm about a person who meditates day and night in the Word of God is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. It has everything it needs. It'll never go dry. It'll never die. And in time, its leaves are green and it never withers. And then in time, it bears its fruit. Same thing here. See the interconnectedness of all these things throughout the Word of God. And that's one of the things that makes it so awesome. So that if we miss it... Through one source, we'll pick it up through another part of the Word of God. It'll click somewhere else. And then we're not wayside ground that the word that the seed, which is the Word of God, lands on doesn't just lay there and then the devil comes and snatches it away. It'll actually do something in our lives. So what's our lesson here? The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is in you. So the kingdom of heaven starts out small in you. Tiny but with more potential than you can possibly imagine. One man dying on a cross brought the church into into existence. How's that for potential? Other men dying to themselves, namely the apostles and the first disciples and the men that those men discipled. Those men dying to themselves spread that church all over the region, clear across Europe. And I'm not talking about the Middle Ages. I mean, in the first few decades after Christ, Paul was traveling to Spain with the gospel. What about us? That's not a challenge. That's a, hey, don't sell yourself short. You have no idea what God is capable of bringing to life in your life. What He's capable of bringing to fruition in you. You have no knowledge whatsoever of who you can reach. You have no idea. The next person that you talk to about Jesus, they might get saved. 
And they might spark a revival that, that carries over to another country. And if you think that this is fairy tale, that this is unicorns and fairy dust stuff I'm talking about, it's not. It's a matter of historical record. It has happened in many times at many places. A, a certain word spoken by someone. But, but none of that happens. None of that happens if we don't crack out of that seed mode and grow and become that tree that God wants us to be. You love how we can always turn this around and make it into something personal. Because it is personal, or else what good is it? I mean, we're, not just, we're not just up here talking God theory, are we? It's not some intellectual exercise. And I attended a, a, a fascinating lecture and seminar at the New Testament Christian Church as we discussed the finer attributes of the mustard seed. It's not about that. If it's not personal, then it's, it's no good. And so it is personal. You become a tree. You become a shelter for others. I don't mean you turn your home into a homeless place where you just let people flock in. I'm saying that people take encouragement from your walk with God when your Christianity matures like this mustard seed. So it might start out small and it might still be small, but please, for the sake of the world and for the sake of your church, don't let it stay small. Stretch your limits. Try something. I know a man who doesn't even have the Holy Ghost forced himself out of his shell to talk to people about Jesus. Ooh. Uh-oh. All right. You need to move along, preacher, because you're talking about things that I don't want to talk about tonight. Okay, fine. We have other parables. We'll move on to it in just a second. But what's the point? Be a tree. Grow. Grow. Grow, grow, grow as fast as you're willing. And be willing because everybody benefits. You strengthen your brothers and sisters. We're still 2018. This is still the year of strength, isn't it? I'm not looking to go through more strengthening exercises, but we, we have talked about that. That's been, a, that's been a periodic theme throughout this year about what strengthens the body of Christ. What strengthens the individual believer strengthens the entire body of Christ. When we pray for one another, we strengthen the body of Christ. When we let the Word of God speak to us and lodge in our heart and it, we allow it to affect the way we live, we strengthen the whole body of Christ. And that's that's. That's the only thing we want to do with respect to the body, isn't it? We certainly don't want to do the opposite of that. We don't want to weaken it. We don't want to do things that tear down the church of God. We don't want to do things that, that, uh, that damage the faith of our fellow believers. We want to do things that build us up and make us strong. All of us as individuals, as a whole church, and then ultimately as for as many as can be reached for the cause of Christ. Let's move on. Verse 33 begins another parable. He says, Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. What's that about? Well, that's another growth parable, just like the one before that. Something that starts out small, affects the entire environment that it's in, and turns it into something that's good. Well, what's leaven? Leaven is, what I understand, it's pretty much yeast, isn't it? That's yeast. You want some yeast in your bread so that you actually have a loaf of bread instead of a sheet of crackers, right? And it's just about what unleavened bread is. It's just basically saltines without the salt. Man, what good is that? That's like Kool-Aid without the sugar. That, that'll ruin water. That, that, you can't even use that for water. That's awful. You know when mom forgot to put the sugar in too because it hits your tongue and it's like... Blah! It's like when you snuck into your mom's pantry and you broke off that piece of baker's chocolate because they were those huge blocks of chocolate. And you're like, whoa, how did I miss these? And you break one off and you eat it. And it is the most disgusting thing you have ever tasted in your life. And then it's like drooling out of your mouth as you're fleeing from the pantry and leaving a murder trail behind you. You, know, you don't make that mistake. Boy, we lost our parable in the midst of all of that. But it's a growth parable. 
you put yeast or leaven in the dough so that it rises and it turns into a loaf of something you can make some nice sandwiches with or a nice bread bowl for your French onion soup that I will be eating when they finish building that Panera bread up there on Del Range. They have good French onion soup there. At least they did 15 years ago and I lived in Florida and ate some. But it's about growth. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a, a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was leaven. Now usually leaven in the Bible is used as an analog or as a symbol of sin because sin operates the same way. A little bit of sin in a person's life spreads throughout their entire life. And it's like one guy described in, in uh, he described it in terms of criminal law. He said, once you're outside the law, you're all the way outside the law. Well, once you've got a little bit of leaven in your life, then it spreads throughout throughout your entire life and it messes everything up. But in this parable, he's not using it as a metaphor for sin. It's, about a, it's a metaphor for growth. The kingdom of heaven starts out small in the heart of the believer. But if we allow that heart of ours to be an environment in which that can grow, then it will grow. So long as we don't keep toxifying the soil, okay? If, we, if we're talking about the heart as a garden or ground, back to our parable of the sower, you can't keep poisoning the soil with things and then expect the Word of God to grow in your heart. You've got to keep the garden free from that stuff. But in the metaphor of this bread, well, you, if you're going to put... Oh, man, that just jumped out at me. Oh, no, Really? You know, you can put all the leaven in the world in that bread, but unless you put that bread in that oven and turn up the heat, it's never going to become bread, will it? It's just going to be this pan of sticky, gooey, useless dough. There's a lesson in that. That battle you're going through, that's hot. That's heat. It's supposed to be provoking some growth. Where is the most lush and fertile, some of the most lush and fertile grounds in the world are found in miserably hot, humid, tropical climates. Can I get an amen from somebody who's lived in those? Amen. So I dream of going to Tahiti someday and putting my feet up on a white sand beach. You know what? Keep your white sand beach and keep your miserably hot bug-infested, humid tropics. They're only pretty on postcards. Speaking as one who has lived there, not in Tahiti, but in the tropics. So anyway, but some people love it, so hey, whatever. Whatever, whatever trips your trolley, as the saying goes. Let's move on to the next one. Well, actually, the very next verse. He says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. So this is still while he was addressing the crowd that was gathered on the shores. And Jesus was out in the boat using that water as an amphitheater and speaking to them. And then verse 35, let's actually read the whole sentence. Verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now, we talked about this much last week, so we're not going to go into that again, because this is the explanation of the parable of the tares of the field, which was right before the stuff we talked about tonight. So let's jump ahead to verse 44, where I tried to start off at the beginning of tonight's study. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now I'm going to stop right there because this parable and the next parable right after it. and I, No, and the next parable right after it. These next three parables which conclude his series on these parables, which concludes the series of parables, are all parables about gain or about treasure again in the spiritual sense and we're going to teach that next week i thought actually for a split second we were going to get to the end of this chapter tonight yeah right but the two parables that we did cover these are parables about growth growth of the kingdom of heaven that is within us as born again believers to bring about fruition in our lives and now none of that let me clarify this right before we close 
None of these parables profit us a single bit if we don't have the spark of life to this thing in us that is Jesus Christ. They're good parables and they're profound. Okay? And he even says it. He even says it, uh, or, the, or the gospel account here even says it, uh, referring, to the, referring to the prophet there in verse 35, saying, I will utter things which have been kept, from the, kept secret from the foundations of the world. So these are, these are real mysteries, or were mysteries, until Jesus brought them forth and then rendered explanations to them to his disciples. And if you'll remember, he didn't give the explanations to the people that were on the shores. And that tied into other uh, prophecies that we've already talked about. But he explained it to his disciples because it is unto the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, hopefully all of us. If we are his disciples, we are they who hear his word and do it. And so if we don't have Jesus, then these are of no worth and no value to us. But if we do, we, we come into the company of disciples of Christ. And as disciples, it is given to us from heaven to understand these mysteries and what they mean. And uh, I, can, I will only speak for myself. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. These have been a tremendous and revealing blessing to me. And hopefully they have been to all of us. The kingdom of heaven starts out small in us as a grain of mustard seed or as just a little bit of leaven. That's fine. But let it grow. Let it grow. Compel it to grow if you must. And I don't think that you have to. If you give it the right materials to work with, which is a willing, yielding heart, then it will grow. It will absolutely grow and it will bring about things in your life that are nothing short of wonderful. And then that will bless not only you, it'll bless everyone in your home. It'll bless everyone on your job. It'll bless everyone in your church, everyone in your life, if you'll let it. Thank you for listening to Come to the Table. Bible studies from the New Testament Christian Church of Cheyenne. Included in these presentations are red letter studies on the life and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, historical studies on the Old Testament, topical studies on biblical doctrines, and practical studies on Christian life. If you enjoyed this presentation, you can support our efforts by contributing at www.myntcc.org backslash Cheyenne WY giving.